We have another very good sized number here this evening, and I appreciate so much uh, many that I see with us. We have visitors with us still tonight on a Wednesday night. That's wonderful. And uh, I see, see some visitors I wasn't expecting to see here tonight. It's a nice surprise. Um, I'm very thankful, again, to be able to be with you this week. And as I mentioned, on the Lord's Day, it's going to go by very quickly, and it is going by very quickly for me. As much as I'm missing Jennifer and, and my kids and my granddaughter, who happens to be in town while I'm out of town, that's not very fair. Um, I am enjoying my time here with all of you so much, and it has been a tremendous encouragement uh, to worship with you, to study God's Word with you, but getting to know you better, being in your homes, and uh, enjoying the hospitality that's been provided uh, I just can't tell you enough how much I appreciate what everyone is providing here. I've got a wonderful place to stay, and uh, just, just everything this congregation is doing, uh, I, I just can't express it enough. So uh, please know that. You know, as I mentioned in our Bible class period on Sunday, sometimes in our Bible study we come across a, a passage that we realize, wow, there's, there's something there. There's, there's more there than what I've realized and I want to come back to that when I have time and, and dig a little bit deeper. And that's what we did in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 in the first two verses Sunday morning in our Bible class. And really, that's, that's uh, exactly what happened as I read through this text in Philippians chapter 1 that we just went through. And especially as I came there to verse 9, uh, where he speaks about the fact that Paul's prayer was that they would abound still more and more uh, that their love would abound still more and more in knowledge and in all discernment. It's one of those passages where you think there's, there's some obvious things there about that, but you know that's just an aspect or it's a statement about love that I don't know that I've really explored, and it's one that I don't know that I've seen elsewhere in the Bible. You know, as we look at this passage, just like we did Sunday morning, we want to take in the context of the text that we're looking at. The text in its context is always going to be where we find the keys that we need to find to understand it. And, and again, as we've already read, one of the first things that we notice in this text is Paul is expressing his tremendous affection for the brethren at Philippi. And that should not surprise us. He speaks about his remembrance of them in verse 3. What would his remembrance be of the brethren in Philippi? Well, imagine how sweet it would be as he remembers the conversion of Lydia and her household. I'm sure that that was one of those moments, one of those events in his life that it kind of came out of nowhere. He knew that he knew based upon the, the man of Macedonia that said, come over and preach to us, that there were honest hearts there. But I'm not sure what, what he was expecting as he went out to that place of prayer. But Lydia had an honest heart. And not only that, but later in the chapter, the, the conversion of the Philippian jailer, Wow, I'm, I'm sure that that's one that Paul probably would be at the pinnacle of all of the conversions that Paul ever went through because of the difficulty and, and the way that things looked while he and Silas were in prison. And yet they were praying and singing hymns to God. And as a result of that, the Philippian jailer is convicted of who they are and what he needs to know. And then Paul speaks about their fellowship in the gospel. I think the translation that was read said so their par partnership and it is the Greek word koinonia. It's the idea of a sharing, a partnership, or a fellowship in something. And we pointed this out Sunday, that the idea of fellowship, sometimes when he talks about fellowship in the gospel, he's talking about their support of him in the gospel, financial support. And that's certainly true of the brethren in Philippi, because when we get to chapter 4, this is where he speaks about the fact that no church shared with him concerning giving and receiving, but them only. So I know that they had fellowship with him in that way. But I think more importantly, the fellowship he's talking about here is their sharing in obedience to the gospel. It's the most important sharing that, that there is between a teacher and a hearer. And I believe that that's the fellowship, that's the sharing that is spoken of in Galatians chapter 6, by the way. But as he speaks about this fellowship in the gospel, they were obeying what they were taught. And, and Paul speaks about his affection for them being the same affection as that of Jesus in verse 8. And what he means by that is it's the same kind of affection that Jesus had for them. What is that? It's a sacrificial affection. And it's a sacrificial affection in that 
Paul was sacrificing in Philippians chapter 4, and in verse 12, he said, I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I've learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. Paul learned that by preaching the gospel. And when he was preaching to the brethren in Philippi, look at what he went through in order to deliver the gospel to the brethren there in that city. Yes, he had a sacrificial affection for them. As a matter of fact, you look back here in chapter 1, he even mentions in verse 7, he says, just as it is right for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart in as much as both in my chains and in defense and confirmation of the gospel, you're all partakers of me of this grace. You know, as Paul was writing this letter, he's a prisoner, he's in chains. Yes, this is the same kind of affection that Jesus had for them. And then his prayer for them is that, that their love would abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment, that they would prove of things that are excellent. We'll talk more about that at the close of this study, that they would be sincere and without offense, and that they would be filled with the fruits of righteousness. All of this sets the stage for us, but Paul is speaking about this great need for love to abound in knowledge and in all discernment. And that's the, that, that's the part of it that jumped out at me. And I don't know if it has for you. Maybe this is something that you've ran across as well. But it's something that I believe that we need to focus on. Because there is absolutely no doubt that the Bible emphasizes the importance of love. And, and I fear that sometimes we have to be so mindful of giving the balance in our preaching because false religion, the, de the denominations of men focus so much on love and leave out everything else that I feel like so much of my preaching has to be to balance that that I maybe don't preach often enough about love and about the importance of love. And, and I'll be honest with you. You know, as I've looked, talking about the importance of love, as I've looked at challenges in my life, as a husband, as a father, as a gospel preacher, as a son, I have realized that in most cases, if there's a failure, it has either been as a result of either selfishness or a failure in this area of love. It, that, that my love has not abounded to the point that it needs to. I, I, we cannot express enough. We can't emphasize too much the importance of love in our faith and in our walk with the Lord. In Colossians 3, and in verse 14, Paul would say to the brethren there, above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. You know, it, it almost sounds trite. When there are problems among brethren, when there's difficulties within a church, love is the bond of perfection. And, and I understand it is a concept that is overused, and that's the reason we need to have this study, because when a lot of people talk about love, well, you just need more love, or, or we need to focus on love, they're talking more about a feeling. And this text is going to show us that that's not the whole of love. But if we understand accurately what love is, I'll tell you, that's, that's pretty much true. When there's a problem in a marriage, when there's problems with children, when there's problems with brethren, in almost every case, if we get our love right for the Lord and for one another, we're probably going to resolve that problem. It, it just really is that serious. And that's why I said, above all these things, put on love. It is the foundation. When Jesus was asked, what is the greatest commandment? He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. And the second, so I can do it, love your neighbor as yourself. I'd say love's pretty important. He said, on these two hang all the law and the prophets. So brethren, let me say right now that while we must be sure that we teach and instruct to find the balance between godly fear and at the same time the proper love, let us not leave out love because it is taught so much in denominations. Let us be balanced in our preaching. We don't always have to give the counter. We need to preach the whole counsel of God and that includes this love that is the bond of perfection. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and in verse 13, now abide faith, hope, 
and love. These three, but the greatest of these is love. As Paul would write to the brethren at Thessalonica, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, 1 Thessalonians 3, he says in verse 12 and verse 13, and may the Lord make you increase and abound in love. You know, that, that word abound really means to superabound. It, it, it's, uh, it, it's close to a, a hyperbolic word, the idea of, of abounding and, and abounding even more. Paul said, this is what I want to see in you. And there's a lot of things that we need to grow in, but he said, above all these, put on love. And here he said that may the Lord make you increase and superabound in love to one another and to all just as we do to you, so that, listen to this, this is the condition. You've got to superabound in love toward one another and to all, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Young people, I want to tell you that your struggle in fleeing youthful lusts and in overcoming all of the temptations of the world all of the lusts of the flesh, if you are merely focused on an academic understanding of what's sinful and what's not sinful, I dare say that you're going to fail a lot. That you are going to struggle in being consistent. We talked about that Sunday morning in laying aside every weight and, and, and how in my youth I wondered why is it so hard to be a Christian? And I need to lay aside some weights, but let me tell you another key to that. There's another part to that. If you want to be consistent, and that's what this word established means, that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness. That word establish is a word, it conveys the idea of setting something solid. Have you ever built a fence? Have you ever, have you ever helped maybe your, your, your dad or your parents uh, put a post in the ground, tamped it in? That's what the word established means. When you tamp it and you make it solid and you go up to that, you can lean on it, you can pull wire on it, you can do anything you want and that's not going anywhere. And this says that in order for our hearts to be established, blameless, that means consistent, in holiness, in purity, in being different from the world, he said, you know what's going to do that? You need to abound in love. We cannot overemphasize the seriousness of that. But as we get to Philippians chapter one, he expresses that not only do we need to abound in love, but that love needs to abound itself in knowledge and in all discernment. That's what tells us that this idea of love and abounding in love is not just an ooey gooey feeling. It's not just a warm fuzzy that we have toward the people that we like at church or, or someone that we're attracted to if you're dating someone. Love is something that needs to actually abound, super abound in knowledge and in all discernment. Yes, love is important, but the proper love that God calls for that will establish your heart's blameless and holiness is not an ignorant love. It's not just a feeling. It is a love where we know what we love and we know why we love. I have a lot of studies with young couples that are about to be married that have asked me to do their wedding. And I'll always, uh, one of the requirements is that we go through a series of lessons, uh, at least 10, uh, 12 at the most. And we'll go through these lessons. But the first thing that I start out with is I ask them, do you love each other? And of course, they both just kind of... Yeah, and look at each other and bat their eyes. and Yeah. And so I ask them, tell me why you love him. And usually I get a, oh, well, I just love him, you know? And, and I know I'm catching them off guard. They hadn't had time to prepare for that, you know? And of course I ask him too. I usually start with him and uh, really make him feel uncomfortable. But my point is that if you love something or you love someone, you ought to know why. I mean, if it's biblical love, you ought to be able to say because of this, 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 and this. And I guarantee you, I can give you a laundry list of reasons why I love Jennifer. It's, it's, it's incredible. But I will admit to you 
early on in our relationship, I could give you some whys, but not nearly as many as I can now. That's just the way that love is. I understand that. But love does need to have a, a, a knowledge of who we love and why. You know, the Bible tells us in Matthew 22, Jesus said that we're to love God with all of our heart, mind, and soul. That mind part. He's telling us that our love must be an intelligent love. Our love is not blind. Our love is not merely a feeling. It is not merely an emotion. Our love is discerning. You see that? The word discernment means the ability to judge well. It is a perception of things. And so what I'm saying is that our love for our fellow man, our love for our parents, our love for our mate, our love for the person that maybe you're, that you're dating or you're falling in love with, our love for the Lord. It needs to be a love that sees things as they are, objectively, truly as they are. And our love for our fellow man, our love for the person that we're falling in love with, needs to be a love that sees the dangers and also sees the potential. It's realistic that's knowledge and that is discernment. And that's, I, I realize that that doesn't sound very romantic. But I want to tell you, that is the kind of love that will bring two people together that will stay together. And that's the kind of love that is going to build churches that are solid. And love, the idea of love is being hijacked today and it's being misused to accommodate every form of error and of selfish worldliness. And this text is going to help us to see through that. So biblical love is based upon knowledge and it is discerning. What are some ways, what are some areas where we might make that application? I want to start talking to the young people and I want you to raise your radar, put up your antenna. I want you to focus on this for just a moment. When we talk about love abounding in knowledge and discernment, that applies when we're talking about dating or romantic love. When it's someone that you're attracted to, that you're interested in, and wow, you just cannot even put it into words the way you feel about this person. That's great. That's a wonderful time in life, and God expects us to experience that and to enjoy it. And there is also an empty type of love, though, that you need to be careful about because the world has hijacked this word, and it is misused so often. Look with me over in the book of Proverbs in chapter 7. You remember in Proverbs 7, the young man that was devoid of understanding? He was in the wrong place at the wrong time. He was near the immoral woman's house, and it was at midnight, and she came out to him, and she was, she was charming him. She swept him off his feet, and I want you to notice what she says to him in verse 18. In verse 18, she says, Come, let us take our fill of love until morning. Let us delight ourselves with love. For my husband is not at home. He has gone on a long journey. He's taken a bag of money with him and will come on an appointed day. She's assuring him he's not going to surprise us. We're safe. It's good. She is, she is trying to convince him that what they're about to do is love. And it wasn't in any way, shape, or form. This is a case of somebody taking that word and completely misusing it. That is an empty concept of love. I want to tell you a love that abounds in knowledge and discernment is a love that, first of all, knows and discerns the dangers and the pitfalls of dating. That is, of two young people attracted to one another that are not married. There are some natural dangers and pitfalls there. That doesn't mean that you need to just run from it, but it means that you need to be aware of it. Remember I said that that, that love abounding in knowledge and discernment is, uh, sees the danger and also sees the potential. And there are ways that you can navigate through that and be safe, but there's some things that you need to know. First of all, look with me in Proverbs chapter uh, 7 and in verse 7. He said, I saw among the simple, I perceived among the youths, a young man devoid of understanding, passing along the street near her corner, and he took the path to her house. You know what he was devoid of? What did he lack? 
Understanding, that's the same thing as discernment. That's the same thing as knowledge there. He didn't have this. He didn't see the dangers. He didn't see the pitfalls. Now drop down to verse 21. In verse 21, I want to read all the way down through verse 27. In verse 21, it says, With her enticing speech, she caused him to yield. With her flattering lips, she seduced him. Immediately, he went after her as an ox goes to the slaughter. I don't know if you've been around animals very much. We used to butcher our own beef. They have no idea. They think you're leading them in there to get some feet. He said, he went, he went in with her as an ox goes to the slaughter or as a fool to the correction of the stocks till an arrow struck his liver as a bird hastens to the snare. He did not know it would cost his life. Verse 24, now therefore listen to me, my children. Pay attention to the words of my mouth. Do not let your heart turn aside to her ways. Do not stray into her paths for she's cast down many wounded. Listen, and all who were slain by her what does it say? We're strong men. I know that you're thinking, well, it's okay, Brett. I can handle this because I'm strong. Now, I, I've got the right Bible class teachers and, and I go to church every, every week and, and I'm, I'm strong. I, I'm in a good place. All who were slain by her were strong men. That's why God says in 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 12, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. There's some things that we do not need to go near. We need to stay away from. Verse 27, her house is the way to hell, descending to the chambers of death. There is a discernment. There is a knowledge. And that knowledge is that anyone that gives the signs or the indications of immorality, anyone that is sending the signals of sexuality before marriage, you better run. Young woman, young man, either one, you better run. You need to have that knowledge and that discernment. You cannot afford to play with the strength of that desire. God gave us that desire, and it's a wholesome thing. It's a good thing, and it's a strong thing, and that's wonderful in marriage. It's incredibly dangerous outside of marriage. Knowledge and discernment. In Proverbs chapter 5, the wise man would say there in verse 1. In Proverbs chapter 5, beginning in verse 1, My son, pay attention to my wisdom, lend your ear to my understanding, that you may preserve discretion, see it? And your lips may keep knowledge. There it is. For the lips of an immoral woman drip honey. Her mouth is smoother than oil, but in the end she is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death. Her steps lay hold of hell. Lest you ponder her path of life. Her ways are unstable. You do not know them. What he's saying is don't think, well, I, I got this. I can handle this. He said you don't and you can't. You need to get completely away from that. We see that Joseph fled from Potiphar's wife. He had a knowledge. He had some discernment. In Proverbs 6, he says in verse 23, the commandment is a lamp and the law a light. Reproofs of instruction are the way of life to keep you from the evil woman, from the flattering tongue of a seductress. Do not lust after her beauty in your heart, nor let her allure you with her eyelids. For by means of a harlot, a man is reduced to a crust of bread and an adulteress will prey upon his precious life. I know these these passages we've been reading have to do with an immoral woman and a young man that is foolish. And, and there's, there's, I believe there's a reason for that. And that reason is because primarily, biologically, young men, they are driven more by this desire than what young women are. That doesn't mean that young women aren't tempted with the same thing. And these passages apply just as much to the young woman as they do to the young men. But there are some things that God warns, especially to young men about. A man looking at a woman to lust for her. I, it, biologically, scientifically, I have the data. It's been proven that there is, it's off the charts, the brain activity. And when a man looks at something that is sexual, when a woman looks at it, it's not even the same. That doesn't mean that there's not a tremendous temptation for both. But God made us different. And that's the reason he's addressing it in this gender way. But I want you to realize that a young woman has to beware of the same temptation and to understand that there are so many young men that are going to try to charm and try to do the same thing. 
You've got to avoid that. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 4. In, in Hebrews chapter 13, Paul says in verse 4, marriage is honorable among all and the bed undefiled. Parents, we need to make sure that we are very clear, that we are unashamed, that we talk to our children about this, that sexuality and intimacy in marriage is not shameful. It's not dirty. It's something that God intends that is pure and it is beautiful. Now, there is discernment and there is tact. <laughs> we, we need to be wise about those things and how we talk about it. But our children do not need to grow up thinking that sexual intimacy is dirty and that they have, they're allowed to do it in marriage, but it's still something that's bad and dirty. No, it's not. In marriage, it is pure and it is wholesome. It's something that is going to, to help build the bond of that marriage. But outside of that marriage, it has no place. That's where it is wrong. He says, but fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. He's warning us about the strength and the power of this temptation and that we must know and understand the challenges that are associated with it. So what does that mean? Let's, let's get down to the practicality of this. I know that you already know these things. Oh yeah, fornication is wrong. I grew up hearing sermons that said that fornication was wrong, but I don't believe I ever had a class or ever heard a sermon on practical ways to be able to overcome that challenge. No lessons for young men. Of course, back then we, didn't, we weren't faced with anywhere near the same thing that you're faced with today with online pornography and smartphones and the access to it. But it was still around then. There were no lessons on how to overcome that. We need to be able to speak practically about this. And men of this congregation, if we don't address this problem, this is an epidemic. It's beyond an epidemic today. And if we don't address it directly with the young men of the congregation, and in some cases the young women, the older women need to do that, then we're going to be eaten up by it. We really are. Satan is having a heyday in our culture and in the church with this problem of pornography. We need practical studies with the young men. There needs to be accountability. And I, I fear that there's been these generational sins where dads didn't, they, their dad didn't talk to them. They don't know how to deal with it, so they sure don't know how to talk to their son. And so what happens? It just keeps on going. And let's stop it right now. Let's figure out how to fix that. Young people, there are some practical things you can do. Turn to Romans chapter 13. In Romans chapter 13, I want you to begin reading with me in verse 13. I don't care what sin, what temptation you're challenged with, God will provide a way of escape. And that's what I want to look at with you. In, Proverbs, in Romans chapter 13, he said in verse 13, let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now listen to this. You need to highlight this in your Bible. Underline it. Put a star next to it. If you don't like to write in your Bible, then underline it in your neighbor's Bible. Just reach over there and put an underline on it. He says, make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. I don't know of a more profound and practical thing to do than that. You know what that means, make no provision? You know, when I, when I arrived here Saturday evening, provisions had been made for me to stay here for a week. Looked like even longer. <laughs> I, I'd think about it if Jennifer was with me. And, and it is so comfortable. Everything is there, everything I could need or ask for. And those provisions were made to make it comfortable for me to stay and to be there. That's what provisions are. And what he's saying here is, don't do that for the lust of the flesh. Don't create an environment that makes it easy to stay or, or comfortable to be in that situation. What are some things that might make the lust of the flesh comfortable? Well, if you're going out on a date and you go to a movie, and I don't care what it's rated because almost all of them have intense worldliness, you go to a movie, it's just the two of you, and there is a lot of sexual innuendo, 
probably a lot of immodesty. There's a lot, just a lot of sexuality in the movie. And you're sitting next to someone that you're incredibly physically attracted to. You're creating an environment that's going to stir up those lusts. When you listen to music with lyrics that are extremely sexual, that's going to stir up those kinds of ideas and lusts. When you go on a date with someone and they are dressed immodestly, it's already difficult enough to keep all of that in check, but when you're seeing a part of their body that God never intended for you to see, it, it, it's going to be something that you're not going to be able to consistently overcome. You're setting yourself up for failure is what I'm saying. When you're dating someone and you go back to a place where it's just the two of you alone, maybe her apartment, his apartment, Maybe the parent's house and no one's there. You're setting yourself up for tremendous failure. Let me tell you, you can be assured that nothing will ever happen sexually with the person you're dating if you make sure that the two of you, when you're together, are always in public. <laughs> I can just guarantee that. I mean, that, that's a pretty simple rule. Now, that's going to be difficult at times. You're going to say, well, no one's there. I wish we could go back. We can't yet. Yeah. Uh, let me tell you, when you start dating that person, you make, you make a plan. You make an agreement with that person. We are never going to be alone together without other people around. You know, I have an agreement with my wife that I'm never going to be alone around another woman. And it's not because I can't trust myself or I think that women are so bad. It's that I know that if I keep that agreement, nothing will ever happen, ever. If I'm going to meet with another woman, my wife's going to be there, one of the other elders or, or someone like that. These are just some of the things that God's saying. What you're doing is you're building a hedge around this relationship to protect it because I want to tell you, it is that important. It is that value. And if it's not important to you, it is to the person you're dating. You owe it to them. Make no provision. And this, you know, even when it comes to your interaction with one another, you know, there's, there's been a lot of talk and question about, you know, kissing and, and how much physical contact can be there. I'm going to tell you every amount of that that you bring into your relationship is going to introduce temptation. That's the reason that God tells Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 5, in verse 1 and 2, to conduct himself around the younger sisters or, or around the younger women as sisters. Now, I know you're thinking, I don't want to date my sister. <laughs> I understand. I wouldn't either. But what he's saying is, if physically you'll handle yourself the same way you would around your sister, I give my sister a hug. I give her a kiss on the cheek. It's absolutely pure. There's a place for those things. But when you're handling it in that way, you're going to be safe. In the Song of Solomon in chapter 2, turn over here and notice this with me. Song of Solomon chapter 2. He says in verse 4, he's talking about this young man and this young woman that are falling in love. Song of Solomon chapter 2 and verse 4. This is the Shulamite girl. This is the young woman. Young ladies, I want you to listen. She says, he brought me to the banqueting house. His banner over me was love. That's a metaphor. What she's saying is, he's letting everybody know, I'm the girl. He's in love with me. And young men, that's really important. You, you don't literally put a banner over her, but when you open the door for her, when you stand up, when she enters the room, when you, I know, I know that's old fashioned, but I'm going to tell you, that goes a long ways in showing her how valuable she is to you. And so listen to how that impacts her in verse 5. She says, sustain me with cakes of raisins, refresh me with apples, for I am lovesick. That's a little dramatic, you know, but it's sweet. She's, what she's saying is, I'm swept away. But then in verse 6, his left hand is under my head, and his right hand embraces me. Here's the physical contact. And look at verse 7. I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the gazelles or by the does of the field, do not stir up or awaken love until it pleases. It's almost as if she is being swept away in this dream night and that co physical contact occurs and it's like she says, stop. 
Don't stir up or awaken that until it's time. And when you're not married, it's not time. That is a lesson. That's how you're going to overcome. That's how your heart's going to be established in, uh, in blameless, uh, blameless in holiness is to understand the power of this attraction, the strength of this desire, you know, a, a freight train with all the weight of all those cars takes a while for it to get going, but once it's going, it doesn't stop on a dime, does it? it? Takes a while to get that thing slowed down and stopped, and you stir up and you awaken this desire. It's a dangerous thing. It's a powerful thing. And so this is the warning that's here in First Peter in chapter uh, 2, in verse 11. I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against the soul. Don't think that I'm saying that you can't have any fun. You can have an incredible amount of fun. Just be safe. Be wise. The wise man would say in Ecclesiastes 11 and verse 9, Rejoice, O young man, in your youth. Let your heart cheer you in the days of your youth. Walk in the ways of your heart and in the sight of your eyes, but know that for all these, God will bring you into judgment. Therefore, remove sorrow from your heart. Put away evil from your flesh, for childhood and youth are vanity. Don't think that you've got to do this while you're young. Childhood and youth are vanity. You need to be wise. You need to play the long game. You need to realize that really a lot of the things that take place in youth, their bearing on the rest of your life is going to have everything to do with how wise were you. Because if not, you're going to look back later in life and have so many regrets things that you can't talk about, things you can't tell your children about, things that you're ashamed of. You've got to realize the seriousness of this and to know these dangers that are there and, and discern the other person's value. As I said, even if you don't value your own purity, treat that person with respect. I mentioned this earlier in 1 Timothy 5, in verse 1 and 2. Do not rebuke an older man, but exhort him as a father, younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, younger women as sisters with all purity. You need to protect that other person's honor and their purity. And you know who you need to protect it for? Their future mate. You say, well, that's going to be me. You don't know that. You do not know that yet. <laughs> you protect it for their future mate. And if you are, you'll be glad you did. Because I'm going to tell you, even if you are their future mate, any indiscretion that happens before you get married will leave guilt and self-loathing in both of you, and it will affect your marriage. I'm not saying you can't overcome it. We can be forgiven of everything. I'm going to tell you, it's going to linger there for a while. Do not think that you're in love based on a feeling. Treat them with purity and respect. And you know, there's a principle that we understand in our daily life. In Matthew 7 and verse 12, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. When you're dating, treat one another with consideration. Don't try to break someone's heart. Treat them as you would want to be treated. You know, the thing to remember is you may be looking across the building, the assembly, at that person with their future mate and their children one of these days, and you're going to hope that you handle them with respect and with honor and with purity. Not only for young people, but we also need to see the application of this in a husband's love for his wife. You know, the Bible tells me uh, in Ephesians 5 and in verse 25, husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. Yeah, we're to love our wives, but there's an empty love. That is a husband that claims to love his wife but abuses her. Most abusers claim that they love their mate. Or maybe there's abuse through selfishness giving themselves over to their career or to money or, or other pursuits, hobbies, and they never have time. There's never a relationship that is built. A husband neglects his wife and leaves her with the kids to work on whatever he's interested in. No, the, the love that a husband's to have for his wife is a love that is based upon knowledge and discernment, and that is knowing and discerning her value. In Proverbs 31, in verse 27, it says she watches over the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. I tell you, a woman who cares for her family, that woman works. 
She is not idle. It says her children rise up and call her blessed, her husband also. I want to point out the reason her children rise up and call her blessed is because her husband does also. Dads, husbands, you teach your children to value their mom. You teach them how valuable she is and to call her blessed. That is to speak well of her. There's two things that's going to happen when you do that. Your sons are going to be respectful to their mom, which if you don't teach them, if your wife is the brunt of every joke, if you're always joking around and putting her down, you're going to see your sons doing that and they're going to grow up to do that with their wives. And you're not going to like it when they do that to their mom, when they imitate you. Teach them respect for her and you do that by respecting her. And speak highly of her in front of them. And then your sons will speak highly of her. And what they will do is they will find a wife that is as valuable as she is. And they will praise her in the gates. And your daughter will understand the value that you have for her mother. And that will give her security. When she grows up to imitate her mother, she won't feel insecure when she tries to find a man to marry her, she will understand her worth. And notice, he says in verse 29, many daughters have done well, but you excel them all. Charm is deceitful and beauty is passing, but a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her the fruit of her hands and let her own works praise her in the gates. If you're gonna love your wife with knowledge and discernment, that's where it begins. See and understand her value and voice it, express it, Show it. Manifest that love in every way. Praise her for her value as he did in the gates. And we manifest that love by putting our wife before ourselves. That's the idea of leadership, men. It's not getting what you want. It is that when there's a decision to be made and there's something that she would prefer and something you would prefer, and both of them are going to have the same outcome for the family. They are both profitable for the well-being of the family. You're going to choose her way. You're going to want to give her whatever you can. Yeah, there are going to be times where you're going to have to choose something different simply because it is what's best for the family. But when you're choosing selfishly, you're not a leader and you're not God's man. That's not what makes a man. Selfishness destroys a man. And it'll destroy a marriage too. I know of nothing more toxic, more caustic to a marriage than selfishness in either person. Know her, discern, and know her intellectually. Know her emotionally and know her spiritually and not just physically. You know, the Bible tells us in 1 Peter chapter 3 and in verse 7, Husbands likewise dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel, as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered. We need to understand. That means that I need to know. I need to ask questions. I need to listen attentively. This is one of the great challenges in marriage, and I believe it's how God trains us out of selfishness is that he brings a man and a woman together that are as different as different can be because they complement each other. And then that requires communication. And we don't all communicate the same way, do we? But men, we better learn how. Because that's how we're going to dwell with them with understanding. We're going to have to understand the emotional needs that she has, even if we don't have them. I understand that's the way God made her, and that's actually what makes her so good at what she does, uniquely good. But I've got to understand that, and I've got to make some concessions. I've got to be willing to, to make some provisions for those emotional needs. I've got to be able to understand that when the children are little and she's wrestling with the kids, she doesn't get to hear a full sermon, and, and she may not know that she needs this, but we need to know as leaders that she needs some time when the kids are in bed, away from the kids, to pray with you, to hear you pray for her, to open your Bible and to read and to study together so that she can have some focused time. Don't expect her to just do that on her own. That's what a leader does. 
And I don't know of any one thing that is going to build the bond in your marriage and strengthen your love for one another more than that time that you'll take if you'll take it. Yes, we need to know our wives and discern their value. I want to quickly, if I can, make one more point here. This love abounding in knowledge and discernment applies to a parent's love for their children as well. There's an empty love where parents abuse, neglect their children, parents that put their children up on a shelf and take them down just to show them off or try to live through them in their sports or their activities. That's not love. A love that abounds in knowledge and discernment knows and discerns the child's value. The psalmist in the 127th Psalm says in verse 3, Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward like arrows in the hand of a warrior. So are the children of one's youth. I think that's interesting. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior. You know, there's probably a number of different ways uh, of applications of that. But one of the things that I think about, I, I enjoy archery and, and archery hunting. When I think about arrows in the hand of a warrior, you know, as parents, we have a child for a short amount of time. And we are essentially, in the time that we have with them, we, Jennifer and I are, are empty nesters as of last year, and there's still a whole lot we can do for our children to guide, to direct, to help. But I'm going to tell you, there's a whole lot less that I can do now than I could a few years ago. I had a short window of time to take that child and to essentially, metaphorically, draw them back and to set the trajectory for where they would go. And now I've let it go. And for the most part... They're going to go on that trajectory. If it's the wrong trajectory, then they're going to have to fight and fight and, and grapple to be able to overcome the wrong trajectory. But that's what we're doing, parents. Fathers, I cannot express enough how important that time is to listen, to talk, to advise, to talk to your boys about the struggles you went through and to make yourself approachable for them to talk to you about that. To set them on the right trajectory, to talk to your daughters about your value for their mom and, and about your love for them. I'm going to tell you, a, a, a daughter's love, the love she receives from her father is going to create for her a security and a confidence that's going to make her an incredible wife and mother. And of course, moms, you have the same role with your sons. I love seeing my wife with my boys. I have a special relationship with my boys, and I have a special relationship with my daughter. And my wife has the same thing. And I absolutely love it because they're seeing in their mom who they need to marry. They have this tremendous respect, but also this friendship. This is the arrows in the hand of a warrior. But let me tell you where it starts. It, of course, starts with love, and, it, and, and, it, and there is caring for them. But there is another principle in the Bible that we need to understand. <clears throat> our love for our children must know the connection between love and discipline. In Proverbs 13, verse 24, He who spares his rod hates his son, but he who loves him disciplines him promptly. <clears throat> I fear that our culture is impacting the church in parents who are afraid to discipline their children the way the Bible teaches. And the Bible teaches that withholding the rod of correction, punitive discipline, I'm not saying that's the only discipline, that you need to use it all the time. I'm telling you, though, it must be used. Every child's different. And this is the Bible telling us how to train our children. And if we won't do it, he says we don't love them. It astounds me when I hear parents say, yeah, I know, but you know, with my kids, that just didn't work. Really? I wonder if baptism will work with your kids. You ever thought about that? Maybe it won't wash their sins away. I know the Bible says it will, but maybe your kids are different. 
Do you realize how absurd and how arrogant that is? To take what the Holy Spirit has said about children and to say, you figured out a better way. God forbid. And I want to tell you one of the reasons that we're slipping into that is because we're not teaching enough on it. We have got to teach what the Bible says about this. Hebrews chapter 12, listen to what God says about himself. In Hebrews 12 and in verse 5, you've forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons. My son, do not despise, don't think little of, the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. He's, He's using the metaphor of a whipping, of a scourge. He says, if you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. Don't tell me it's not loving. He says in verse 8, but if you're without chastening, of which all become partakers, you are then illegitimate and not sons. Drop down here to verse 11. Now, no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. That tells me something about discipline. It needs to be painful to be effective, okay? A little puff on a diaper is meaningless. As a matter of fact, it actually is detrimental. He says it is is not uh, uh, enjoyable, but it's painful. Nevertheless, afterward it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. There's the idea of discipline. It's training. We're not just punishing. We're training. We're creating an environment to where that child realizes, I don't enjoy the outcome of that. When I do that, it doesn't make me happy. It makes my backside hurt. You know, I mean, for a little kid, that's about the only reasoning they have. You know, when I touch that, my hand hurts. I think I'll quit doing that. And what we're doing is we're teaching that child how to make a decision to stop doing something that is dangerous or detrimental. And that's called self-discipline. And I pray to God that all three of my kids are able to do that successfully now because I'm, I'm, that's over. No, no more of the rod for them. I know that they're hooping and hollering now. But I'm going to tell you, well, don't ask them. I, that lasted a long, well into their life with me because there was foolishness, at least on the part of one or two of them, for a long time. I want you to realize the Bible is giving us the hope, though. In Proverbs 19 and verse 18, chasten your son while there is hope. That indicates there's a time when there will not be. And do not set your heart on his destruction. What would, what would that be? How would I set my heart on his destruction? By not chastening during that window of opportunity. In Proverbs 23 and in verse 13, do not withhold correction. Listen to this, parents. Do not withhold correction from a child, for if you beat him with a rod, he will not die. You shall beat him with a rod and deliver his soul from hell. I'm glad that's in the Bible because my oldest son, I didn't think he's ever going to give in. And I was worried, is he going to be able to stand up to this? <laughs> but that's in there. He won't die. Now the, now the power of it is as a child, I didn't know that verse was in there. I thought I might die, you know, when my dad was going to give me a whip. But it was effective for that reason. Listen to Proverbs 22 and verse 15. Foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. The rod of correction will drive it far from him. Over and over. How many of these verses do we need to read? Listen to verse chapter 20 and verse 30. Blows that hurt cleanse away evil as do stripes the inner depths of the heart. What he's telling you there, parents, is that in order for it to train and to be effective, it has to hurt. Now, how bad does it have to hurt? That depends on your child. And I I do believe that sometimes when a parent says, well, it didn't work with my kid, they weren't willing to go as far as they needed to to get there. I understand that for a lot of people, your only experience with discipline with a rod has been very negative. It's been out of anger, It's been fierce or ferocious. It's been unloving. It's been inconsistent. Or maybe it's been completely absent. And if you've experienced that kind of anger, then your association with this is all negative. All I can tell you is that was unbiblical. But biblical discipline 
is effective. And, and, and let me emphasize this. When, I'm, when the Bible's talking about discipline, it's not saying that that's the magic bullet. And I'm not saying that either. I'm saying this is the element that I see missing so much from so many families in the church. And I want to commend you because I have not heard the ring-tailed fits here <laughs> that I hear in a lot of meetings that I hold. But, but it is not the magic bullet. There are other things that need to go together. And let me tell you what is needed. Number one, consistency. If you tell your kids you're going to do something, do it. Otherwise, you're a liar. And when God calls himself our father, and our father lies to us about punishment, then we're likely to not believe that God's really going to punish us in the end. We are doing a tremendous disservice. Be consistent. Your children need a deep, genuine love. And they need a deep, genuine interest. That means you're going to have to stop what you're doing and just take some time to listen. Go for a drive. Go for a walk and listen. They're going to give you the clues. Ask questions. Talk about things. Make, make points about God's creation. Create the environment to talk about these things. But be interested in them because every kid's going to be different. And this kid, their interest is going to be my interest. And it, it's very easy to really throw myself into that or to try to make all my kids interested in what I'm interested in. That's selfish. And that's ridiculous. You need to train those children. Let them grow up and figure out what they're good at. And you be interested in what they're interested in. Let them know that they are valuable in their own unique way. And you'll have a bond and a relationship with them. That deep, genuine interest then must be coupled with a deep, genuine, determined will to win. And when I say win, I mean win their souls. And one of the things you've got to do to win their soul is you've got to win those battles when they're rebelling against you. And every kid's going to be different. Some of them are going to take you a long ways down that road. My mantra, especially with my oldest son, I would sit down with him before there was discipline and I'd say, Taylor, I'm going to win. I'm just going to tell you, I can do this all day long. I don't know how many of these you want. I'm ready to go as long as you do. I'm going to win. Mentally, he needed to know I was more determined than he was. And I'm certain that it shortened <laughs> The, the, the whole uh, time of what we had to take in that. You've got to be determined to win. You've got to be smarter than your kid. That's a side note. And you need to have a wholehearted devotion. It needs to be more important to you than anything else that you do. It's the greatest investment of your life. Know and discern. And along with that, know and discern their areas of strength and build on their anchors. Demonstrate your genuine interest in your children and build on the anchors in their life. Yes, our love needs to abound in knowledge and discernment. Well, I'll let this be for another lesson. Brotherly love, there's empty love James talks about. We need to know our brethren. We need to discern between matters of faith and matters of opinion. And love does not overlook sin. Maybe we can study that another time. Time has escaped me. Spent too much time on these other points, but I think it was necessary. You know, as Paul closes out uh, in that context, we said that his prayer was that love would abound in knowledge and discernment. Now we understand how that's going to cause us to approve of things that are excellent. There can be no approving without first proving what is good and wholesome. And that we will be sincere. That word means pure, literally. Pure and without offense to the day of Christ. And we're going to be filled with the fruits of righteousness when that love abounds in that way. If you're here this evening and you haven't obeyed the gospel of Christ, we don't want to leave here without extending an invitation to you to come believing in Jesus as the Christ, the Son of God. Confess your faith in him, repent of your sins, and be buried in the watery grave of baptism for the remission of sins. We can assist you with that. All things are ready. Don't put that off. And if as a child of God there's something you need to correct to be right with him, do that. Do that tonight before you leave here. And if we can assist you in any way with that, praying for you, with you, whatever we can do, come forward and make that known while we stand and sing the imitation song.